Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I love verse 17. You should underline this in your Bible. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, His father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Father, we thank you for this word today. Transform our lives with it, Lord. I pray that we come home this morning to you. Thank you for this moment we have together. We pray that it be beneficial. In Christ's name, we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Jesus... um, Luke is recording here a parable that Jesus was teaching. He taught two parables before this on the same subject, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. And you find at the beginning of Luke, chapter 15, that he had, that he had, had some tax collectors and, and, and sinners who had gathered around him and he was talking with them. Matter of fact, in in the first verse of chapter 15, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. I think that's a funny word, muttered. If you're muttering, just shut up. (laughs) But the teachers, Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And if there's anything you should ever put on your gravestone, it's that. This man welcomes sinners and eats. If we could get the reputation of a church. You know what is fascinating to me is that Jesus could operate in both worlds. He didn't only eat with tax collectors and sinners. And he didn't only eat with Pharisees. He ate with all of them. It's so awesome. If It didn't matter who invited Jesus to dinner. He's like, I'm game. If you're eating, I'm eating. I don't care about your reputation. I don't care about your resume. I don't care about what you did last week. If you're having dinner, I'm there. We could learn something from that. We really could. To the point where people were saying, well, he just hangs around the wrong people. He, he eats with tax collectors and sinners was the storyline of his life. From the very beginning, God set it up to be that way that Jesus would invite us to him. There wouldn't, be a, there wouldn't be an uncomfortableness in his presence, but he would invite us to sit and have dinner with him. He would, he would welcome those people around him constantly. And here we are today, feeling no condemnation, sitting in the presence of God. Isn't it amazing? That the perfect God of all creation, the one who spoke everything into existence, the one responsible for everything, could come to earth and then invite the least of these to be with him. I told my son one time, we were, uh, we were, in a, we were riding together and, and, and a moment happened where we, where we had kind of witnessed something. I said, I said Carter, you, you can't be a one-trick pony. And, and I don't even know what that means. Um, I just know it's an old saying. I said, you got you to be able to operate in both worlds, man. You can't just hang around one group of people. You, you, you can't just hang around people that are like you and, and like you. 
I said, you need to be able to operate in a whole bunch of different types of environments. You need to operate with people who have less than you and people that have more than you, people that are not as smart as you and people that are way smarter than you. You need to be comfortable in all these environments. You need to be comfortable with people who are more righteous than you and people who don't know what righteousness is. You need to be comfortable with, with all these types of people and be able to operate in these environments. This is a calling of God on our lives, not to be segregationist as far as are you good or bad or are you like me or not like me, but to be inclusionist, to say, I can, I can eat with anybody. I'm good to go to dinner with anyone. It's Christmas time. I'm good to go to dinner with anyone. <laughs> and uh, if you've ever, sometimes I feel bad because I will go to lunch with some people sometimes, and especially here recently, if you invite me to lunch and you have a, a job that causes you to have to wear a suit, uh, I'm going to show up with work boots and holes in my jeans. And I didn't buy them like that. So uh, you'll get that later. Some of the millennials in here are like, oh, dude, yeah, I get it. Um, but I, I want to be able to operate in both worlds. And Jesus did that masterfully. He could sit with Pharisees and have conversations about the law, and he could sit with tax collectors and sinners and make them feel welcome enough to eat the food. So what happens is, when this is pointed out, he eats with these people, Jesus teaches some parables. It's a parable of lost sheep, how valuable it is, parable of lost coin. And then he gets, Luke records this really descriptive parable about a lost son. And whether you've been in church or not, I'm sure you've heard the term prodigal son. We have either had one or been one, all of us in the room. And for those of you that don't think you are, you probably are now. <laughs> We've either been one or raised one. Prodigalness is kind of in our DNA, it's sin. Jesus starts out the parable by saying, that the, that the youngest son wanted what he wanted from the dad. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about why I think he ran off or what scholars say about it. I will tell you this, that he's the younger son, so he was only going to get a third of what the older son would get. Because in that culture, the oldest, the eldest, would get twice as much blessing. So if you got two kids and he gets twice as much as the other kid, then he gets two-thirds and the, and the youngest gets a third. But... Anyway, he demanded what he demanded. I believe Jesus is painting a great picture of sin here. At the root of all sin is I want what I want. Isn't that true? At the root of all of our sin, it's my will be done, not yours. At the root of everything that separates us from God, it's us getting our way. And so Jesus does a wonderful job of painting a picture to the people that are criticizing him of saying, listen, at the root of everything that's wrong with this is you guys having your way all the time. And, and Jesus then goes to the cross displaying how to break that cycle. Not my will, but yours. And so he starts off in 15 with a parable of saying, listen, the way this guy got into this was demanding his will and the way you get out of it is accepting his. So so he starts off this beautiful parable. It's really detailed. This, this guy, this guy demands what he wants when he wants it. The father gives it to him. Let me back up though. Um, let me say this. I like, the older I get, the more I like being in my house. Anybody else like that? I like to travel. I like to do all those things. But I like coming back to my house. I don't want to be at your house. When I come back from a trip, I want to go back to my house and I want to sit on my chair and I want to eat my food and I want to be in my house because I have, there's benefits in my house that aren't at your house. I own my house. I'll do whatever I want to. Within reason, I am married. <laughs> Got to be honest. Got to be honest. But there's benefits at my house that I can't get at your house. I can't just walk into your house and open the refrigerator door. It'd be weird. As many times as you say, no, help yourself. The first time I did it, you'd be like, oof. <laughs> he took us literally. 
You guys going to eat that? It doesn't look like it's been in there that long. I, there's just benefits of being at home. There's benefits that my kids experience from growing up in my house that they wouldn't get at your house. They can come spend the night at your house, but you're not going to treat them like I treat them. Hopefully you ain't going to whip them. <laughs> but you're not going to, you're not paying for their college. You're not going to make sure that they, that they're getting the good grades in school. You're, they're just visiting. But when they're in my house, it's the benefit of being part of the family. And so what you see here is Jesus is painting the picture that when we demand our own way, that it begins to exclude us from the benefits of being at home. And so the, the story is told beautifully that the man not only leaves, but he leaves and goes to a distant land. And sin always takes us out of the context that God wants us to stay in. It always takes us to a distant place. The culture is different. The values are different. They don't believe in God. Everything is different. And the man goes and leaves. And when you leave the house, you leave all the covering. You leave all the benefits. You leave all the, all the understanding. And he leaves. The Bible says he goes to a distant land. And if you know anything about Jewish culture, pigs are about the dirtiest thing you can get in Jewish culture. And I just want to make a caveat by saying I'm so thankful for the New Testament and, and that whole thing about kill and eat because I'm like, bring the shellfish and pig meat. I'm, I'm with it. <laughs> Stuff the pig meat with shellfish. I, like I just think we live in the land of grace and it's good. But back then, that was as dirty as you could get. And this young man found himself tending those very pigs. And, um, and so he's about as far away from home as you can possibly imagine being, distance-wise, culture-wise, blessing-wise. It said he was hungry enough to eat. There was a, a, I think it was called a carob tree that they would produce these pods and, and they would feed them to the pigs. And he was wishing he could eat that. So there... But I'm glad that the Bible says that no one would give him anything. He was, he was totally out of the realm of blessing. He had left everything. No one would even let him eat the pig pods. And so, so the Bible says in verse 17, which is so beautiful, he came to his senses. When he came to his senses... I just think that's a wonderful phrase when he came to a sense. I think you could superimpose on that when he decided to repent. Because what you see is when he came to his senses, he started doing something different. He, he got up and he started turning and going the other direction. And repentance actually means literally that, to, to turn and do something else. Stop what we're doing now and do something else. And so it says when he came to his senses, he came up with a plan. Jesus painted the picture of sin, of all sin, and then when he came to his senses, Jesus paints the picture of him coming back home. The first thing he thinks about is where he was from. Man, I've sinned and I've ruined it, but now if I could go home. What I need you to understand this morning is you were designed to be in a certain spot. You were designed by God to be in relationship with him. You were designed before the foundation of the world, the Bible says. He, Jeremiah writes at the, at the very beginning of his calling. It says that God knew him before he was formed. That's crazy. And you, you, know, what, you know what the picture is I have in my mind of this? If any of you, well, a lot of you have had kids. And, um, and, and can you remember thinking of your kids before you knew you were pregnant? Like maybe you had the conversation about, about, hey man, we should think about, we should think about having a kid. And you start thinking about the kid before you even know that you're pregnant. The only difference is God actually knows who you are, what you're going to be, what you're going to look like, all your failures, all your successes. He knows all of that. All we know is this kid's got to be awesome. <laughs> For sure. But God knows us intimately. He tells Jeremiah, 
I know all this stuff about you before you ever formed. And I called you to do this. So we have to realize that before you were ever born, before your parents ever dreamed about you, before they ever said, hey, what do you think? God knew you, knew the right space, knew the right environment, knew the right every. He created you for a purpose and a reason. And he put it all together and said, man, man, if they should never leave this. They should never, this is my will for their lives. It's like home. I can just walk into the will of God and be like, man, this fits. It's my chair. It's my TV. It's at the perfect distance. So I come into some of your houses, you don't have the TV at the right distance and it's awkward. It's true. You bought into the, I have a 60 inch TV, you're 10 feet away from it, it's going to hurt. <laughs> Everything's perfect at the house. So what happens is, the young man realizes, when he comes to his senses, he realizes, I gotta go back to where I was meant to be. I gotta go back home. I gotta go back home. It's difficult coming home though sometimes, isn't it? Because everybody knows. Everybody knows. That's like uh, when I was growing up, um, I think it was my first semester of college, I went to a, um, oh man, I don't know if I should tell this. I went to a, I, I, was, I was living at home commuting and I went to a party and um, it was a Christian party. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I went to a party and it got out of hand, chaos. And um, I had lied to my parents about where I was going. I said, man, I'm just going to spend the night with some friends. I was spending the night with some friends, but left out some details. I, I was never a bold-faced liar. I just left out a lot of stuff. I never made up stories. I said, I'm going to spend the night with some friends. And I was. They just didn't know it was 400 of them. It was chaos broke out. A fight broke out. The cops showed up. I knew what I had to do. I had to go home. The issue was I knew who was waiting on me at the house. My parents locked the storm door. There was no sneaking in my house. You couldn't even get to the lock to pick it with a credit card, which I'm pretty efficient at now. Not for the same reason, so. What would happen is so I'm now three o'clock in the morning standing outside the door going bang, 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 bang. Let me say that my parents actually did receive me with the grace of a loving, caring father and mother for 30 seconds. It's difficult to come home though sometimes, isn't it? But when we come to our senses, we know it's the best option. So what happens is he comes to his senses, he, he gets a plan together, he says, um, I'm going I'm to go home. He realizes that people who were not even part of the family were faring better than he was, just because they were in the house. They were better off than he was. So he said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to admit to my dad that I've sinned against. I've sinned against God and him. You realize he gets, he gets the person right. He, he, he doesn't just say, dad, I've disappointed you. He says, man, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against God. He comes to his senses. He repents. He goes back home. And this is the most beautiful part. This is the one I, this is the part that I want to focus on the most. Repentance, well, before we move on, 1 John 1 9, 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? If you will repent and confess, he'll forgive you every time. Come on, listen. That's better than any insurance you could ever have in your life. Because most insurances are three strikes, you're out. But we're going to raise your rates. We're going to raise your rates. You've had a couple accidents here, Mr. Jones. We're going to raise your rates. He says, if, you're, if you will confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And it, sometimes I think about that and I ask God, why? Why would you extend yourself like that? Because I, 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 I would be more comfortable with a situational God, wouldn't you? One that makes sense. 
One that makes sense that when I screw up enough, it's, too, it's, it's just, I, there's nothing you can do about it. But God is so irrational with his grace where he says, if you will confess your sin, I'll forgive you. 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 And Jesus actually demonstrates it for Peter. How many times am I supposed to forgive somebody, Lord? Seven? Come on, Peter. Why don't you just forget about the number game here? Jesus throws some astronomical number out, 70 times seven. He's like, well, with this one guy, I'm close. I'm like 470 something. Jesus is being hyperbolic, trying to make sure he understands. Don't put a limit on it. I haven't put a limit on the grace I'm extending you, so don't you do that to someone else either. I'm going to keep, if, you're, if, you, if you will confess, I'll forgive you. He said, I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I want to say this. Humility is a key to repentance. It's never useful to go back to God and say, well, I mean, it wasn't all my fault. Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Thanksgiving was the key to the gate. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. If that's, if that's all true, I, I was picturing repentance, the key to the actual house. Because I can start out my conversation with God like this. Thank you, Lord, that you're gracious. Thank you that you're merciful. Thank you that I'm not dead now. Thank you that you still sustain me. Thank you. Thank you. God, you're amazing. You're, you're, you're holy. You're worthy. You're, you're, you're worth everything, God. Thank you. Thanksgiving, praise. And then I turn to Lord, forgive me. A sinner. I walk through the gate, I walked into the court, and I unlocked the door. And now I'm home. So the, the story goes that he gets up, makes up his mind, comes to his senses, and he, and he walks back. He's, he's unwittingly walking back to a father that's waiting on him. See, that's the concept that we have that, that's hard for us to, to fathom. When we do God the way he does in this picture of the Father, when we treat God the way he's treating his Father, we, we tend to believe that they're not waiting on us anymore, that they've moved on. That they, that they just went, oh, hey, listen, listen, I ran off. It was my fault, whatever. He's not waiting on me. He went on with his life. The reality is God didn't go anywhere. God didn't go anywhere. It says he was... He was, saw him far off. It's that there's a picture of God waiting on us. He saw him afar off. Like, man, if that, if today might be the day that he comes to his senses. Today might be the day that he comes home. I'm going to keep watch for him. I'm going to keep looking for him. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep looking out there to see if he'll turn today. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He said, today might be the day. Man, if they just come back today, come to your senses today. So the son said to him, Father, actually back up a little, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. That's weird, but that's what they did back then. <laughs> the son said to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, if you realize what he planned to say and what he got out of his mouth, what he got out of his mouth was a little shorter than what he planned to say. Do you remember what he planned to say? He said, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. I'm not worthy to call you my father. Take me back as a hired servant. Do you remember that all the way back there? He says, when he came to his sins, he said, but while a long way off his father saw him filled with compassion to him, he ran, threw his arms around and kissed him. The son said to the father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So what he had planned to say I will sit down and go back to my father. Father, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer going to call your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. The dad doesn't even let him get that out of his mouth. Just shut up, man. You're home. You're home. Now, there's a significance of this you may have never seen before. The significance is that dad meets him while he's away from the house. That's important. 
Because here's what happens in church. We always have the fear when we screw up that we're going to get paraded in front of everybody. I had a conversation with a pastor friend of mine a couple of months ago, and he was telling me a story about another church. I don't even know if it's true, but I'm going to repeat it. It's good for an illustration. He said there was somebody on staff that had made a mistake. I don't even know what it was. And he said, man, I heard that he got up in front of the whole church and apologized. And I was like, ooh, okay. Now, I, let me tell you my knee-jerk thought to something like that. I'm not sure that it does any good. And here's why. Because I don't know that what the guy did had any impact on anyone else in the church. I'm 100% confident he apologized to the people he impacted. But the problem is, is when we're in a culture where we have to parade somebody, then guess what nobody else will do? Nobody else is coming home because they're going to be afraid of the parade. And so my conversation with the other pastor was, listen, you just made it evident to every, everybody in that church that don't you dare confess your sin to somebody because you could end up on stage. Hmm. You know what I'm so thankful of, and I know you don't believe it, is that people can sin and fail here and nobody finds out about it. No, 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 no. Don't miss it. Don't, we, we're, not co we're, not, we're not covering. We're not going to jail for you. We're not, we're not covering that way. We're not covering that way. This ain't no money laundering thing. We're like, hey, man, nobody knows. This, this, isn't, this isn't that. What I'm saying is confess your sins to one another, not on a microphone. Confess your sins to one another in the confidentiality of a grace-filled relationship so there can be healing and deliverance. Not, hey, did you hear what so-and-so did last week? And it has no impact on them whatsoever. No, we need to have a community of trust here where we can fail and be restored gently. Fail and be restored gently. You think the cycle only happens once in your life? Oh, come on, I know better than that. I know me. You fail and restore gently. Fail and restore gently. Fail and restore gently. And if that cycle is not protected in our community, there will be no cycle. There will be no restore gently. So every now and then, you got to run outside the house to take care of it before anybody else knows. It's not a parade of shame. It's a celebration they're going to have. So if we, if we wait until the repentant son comes into the house, shameful with his head down, you just killed the celebration. Well, we were going to throw a party, but man, is he in a bad mood. The father goes out and meets him and says, shh, stop talking about that. You're not part of the family. Don't say that. I can picture the dad yelling back on, hey, hey, bring the robe out. We're going to dress him up before we bring him in. Bring some sandals out. Kid better be wearing shoes if he's coming to my house. Bring that ring out. Oh, you wanted me to bring the ring? Bring the ring. I know he's the youngest. Just bring the ring. And get that fatted calf ready. We were, we were saving for some special guest. Get it ready. So you see what God does? He meets you outside. Dresses you up like you don't deserve it. And then walks you into a party that's already started. Can I say this to you? If there's shame and guilt beyond forgiveness, it's us, not him. It's us, not him. And I'm so proud to be part of a church that we can all mess up. Come on, somebody say amen. We can all mess up. We can all mess up. And there's somebody to dress us up outside before we walk in. So we're not walking past a gauntlet of, of, of scoured brows. We're not walking past a gauntlet of people going, I knew it. We're walking into a celebration of he's come home. My son that was dead is now alive. My son that was gone is now found. And now we're going to celebrate. There's no room here for discord. There's no room here for accusations. Matter of fact, the other son, we're not going to get into that. The other son tried to come around. He's like, what are you talking about? You've been here the whole time, benefiting the whole time. Shut your mouth and start eating the cow. Come on, be quiet. We, I dressed him up out there for this very reason. 
I dress them up outside for this very reason. And that's what God's trying to do to you. If we come to our senses, now here's what happens to us. I heard this, Will Smith said this one time. He said, man, I've been taking acting lessons my whole life. He said, when I grew up, my mom used to slap me on top of the head and said, act like you got some sense. I follow a, uh, a, a custom home builder on Instagram. I follow a lot of those type of guys, woodworking custom home builders, those type of things. And I thought it was a quote that he made up, and then I realized he got it from someone else. He got it, it's a big scientist guy. I don't even know. He's, he, he's, he's a German, I think. Aubrey, Aubrey de Grey. And I don't know nothing about him. But he said this. Don't cling to a mistake just because you spent a lot of time making it. Don't cling to a mistake just because you spent a lot of time making it. You know what? My fear for the church is, is that they put the robe on us, they put the sandals on us, they put the ring, I can smell the calf cooking, and yet I'm still acting like I'm feeding pigs. And my word to you today is act like you got some sense. Why don't the church act like we got some sense? We've repented. We have been forgiven. We have been covered in the blood of Jesus. And when God looks down on us, he sees nothing. I don't care how long it took you to make the mistake. I don't care how long it took you to cover it up. All he cares about is how long it took you to repent. Had the, in the instant that you decided to come to your senses and walk back to him, he said, that's all I need. Boom. Now I'm coming to you, and now we're cleaning it up. Now we're, now we're, right now we're going to dress you up, and we're going to come into the party. It's already going to be started when you walk in the door. And we're going to come in and celebrate that you came home. We're not even going to talk about how long you've been gone. We're not even going to talk about how long you've been messing up. We're not even going to discuss it right now. We're just going to party. That's so beautiful. It's such a picture of how God treats us every single day. It's such a great picture of how the church should operate. It's such a great picture during Christmas. Jesus, God's only son, came to the world, not to condemn the world, but that through, the, through him the world might be saved. And so Emmanuel, God with us, God sent Jesus to dress us up. Think about that. He sent him to dress us up for the party. Get dressed. Put the ring on. Put the robe on. Put the sandals on. We're going to the party. And we walk around still upset about how bad it was, how, how bad we did. How, how, look how long it took me to do this bad. I'm dressing you up for the party. Did you hear the club music start? Boonch, 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 boonch. <laughs> We were at Old Navy last night, and I was standing behind the guy. The music was playing, and he couldn't help himself. He was just like, <laughs> I was like, bro, I can't. I can't. I'm going to just stand here and act like I don't see you. I can't. I don't, I don't want to flash mob right now. I want to go eat. <laughs> Came to his senses, and he went home. Home. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to pray this morning. There's some of you here who were forgiven five years ago and you never forgave yourself. You've been walking around like you got no sense. Some of you are going to decide this morning to turn and go home. Repent. Some of you need to celebrate. You need to join in on the party. Can I say this? If the party's for you and you sit over in the corner, ain't nobody going to have any fun. I want to celebrate coming home. I want to celebrate being in the house. I want to celebrate all the good stuff that's coming with it. 
Let him dress us up. Let him clothe us in righteousness today. Not by my works, not by the only good decision I ever made was to come to my senses. The only good decision I ever made was to go home. It wasn't anything I did. I didn't deserve it. But when I got there and said, I don't deserve it, he went, shh, let me dress you up. Let me dress you up today. We're going to celebrate. Can we do that this morning for a little bit? I just want to give you a couple minutes. Maybe you bow your head, close your eyes. I just want to give you a couple minutes. And just let God forgive you again. Just let him forgive. Maybe it's the first time that you've ever prayed anything like this. Maybe it's the first time and you're saying, Lord, I don't even, I can't even think back how I got here. But I'm coming to my senses this morning. I just want to come back. If you just let me come back. Forgive us, God. Dress us up. Take away all the guilt and the shame. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Take it all away. Dress us up in clothes we don't deserve. And give us a place that we don't deserve. Come on, I pray that you maybe pray that for the first time. Stop running. Stop making excuses. Just come back. The Father is waiting and has been waiting. He wants to forgive you, wants to give you freedom and peace. He wants to take away all your guilt. Just let him do that this morning. Forgive us, God. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Wipe away our shame this morning, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. We accept what Christ did for us today. Lord, and we pray your promise to inherit what we do not deserve, the ultimate part. I pray that you dress us up this morning. Dress us up nice. Dress us up in clothes we can't afford. Dress us up in clothes we don't deserve. Dress us up for a party that we shouldn't be having. But your grace and your mercy. Dress us up this morning because we're coming home, God. There's no shame when we enter back into the house, God. It's just a big celebration. Dress us up this morning, God. Thank you. Thank you, God. Come on, if you prayed that prayer this morning, could you just give him praise and honor and glory? He deserves it. Come on. Amen.